Good morning and welcome to First in Future. I'm Maggie Woods, Policy and Program Manager at the Institute for Emerging Issues and serving as guest host today for Leslie Boney, who's on a well-deserved vacation. Welcome to this, our 15th special webinar since the coronavirus hit. Today's show is sponsored by Tony Brown in honor of Jeff Braden, Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at NC State. Tony is a principal at PCG and a national advisory board member for IEI. Let me start by saying I'm really grateful for you for tuning in for the past couple weeks um, when we've been taking on a variety of fast emerging issues, including small business, entrepreneurship, the path back from unemployment, food and food insecurity, as well as many others. We appreciate your confidence in us and your active participation in these conversations. For the month of June on this program, we'll be looking at what recovery looks like as we try to jumpstart business, government, schools, and learning. We will be talking with people who are right now in the middle of the struggle, trying to figure out a way forward, the issues they're wrestling with, the plans they're suggesting to help move forward. And today we're talking about jumpstarting connectivity, specifically eliminating the digital divide in North Carolina's cities and towns. We will be exploring how cities and towns across the state are addressing the digital divide and emerging from the pandemic with key strategies to increase digital access and skills. The digital divide, meaning those who have access to the internet and computers and devices and those who do not, was a major challenge before the pandemic hit. But now a spotlight is shining on the issue. If you don't have internet in your home or can't afford it, and if you don't have a computer or a laptop, there's so many things you can't do. You can't do your homework, you can't work from home, you can't apply for unemployment, access your doctor, or even access your bank. It is not hyperbole to say that in a pandemic, the internet is a lifeline. So as our society and economy begin to open, we know that creating more digitally equitable communities is imperative to our current and our future growth. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And if you're joining us live, welcome. We encourage you to be a part of the conversation. You can type in your chat in the chat box. Um, we wanna hear from you. We wanna hear your community's challenges with connectivity right now. We wanna hear your personal challenges. Maybe you're a parent and you've been navigating how your child can get online and learn. Maybe the older people in your life are having trouble using devices to access their banks and networks. Maybe you're interested in reskilling and learning some new skills online right now. What would you like to see for the future? So we wanna hear from you and hear your questions and we'll get to as many of those questions as possible. But first, I do wanna start with some stats about connectivity in North Carolina pre-pandemic. And you'll see that on this slide, um, we've split it up in a couple categories. We have internet access, internet adoption, and devices. So according to the FCC, almost 95% of North Carolinians have access to the internet. Now we know if you've been following this issue at all, that this is a very flawed statistic. Um, this looks that if, if in any given census tract, if one household has access to the internet, the entire census tract is considered having access to the internet, which we know in North Carolina is just not true. Um, but it is the best statistic we have at the moment. Um, the second element of the digital divide is internet adoption. And internet adoption just means, are you subscribing to the internet? Are you paying, paying for it to subscribe in your house? And so we know that about 22% of North Carolinians aren't subscribing to any kind of internet. And about 40% of North Carolinians aren't subscribing to what's considered high-speed internet or broadband. Um, and this is internet that you need in order to do most of your daily activities online. Um, and finally, devices is another major issue. So um, we know that about a quarter of North Carolinians don't have access to a desktop or laptop, and about 9% of North Carolinians are only accessing the internet through their smartphone. And this is also problematic because a smartphone does not um, gain you as much access as a computer or laptop would. And I know we have some guests who can talk a little bit more about that today. But as you delve into these statistics, um, you can see that there are significant disparities the further you go into it. 
Um, so for about the 50% of North Carolinians, for 50% of North Carolinians living on less than $20,000 per year, only 50% of them are subscribing to broadband. That's compared to almost 95% of those living on $75,000 or more a year who are subscribing to broadband. And this, the disparities go even further as you delve into race and ethnicity. These are national numbers, but Pew Research shows that 79% of white US adults have home broadband, while the same is true for only 66% of black adults and 61% of Hispanics. But today we're going to be delving deeply into the urban digital divide. And so I do want to share an anecdote with you about the, the urban digital divide. This comes from Larry Irving, um, who is who coined the term the digital divide and who's been working on this issue his entire career. And he spoke at our emerging issues forum back in February. And here's what he said. Let me put this in context. We talk about the digital divide. We talk about urban versus rural. But there are four times as many people in urban households who don't have broadband at home because they can't afford it as there are rural Americans who don't have broadband because they can't access this. And I share this because this shows that this is an us problem. It's not a rural problem. It's not an urban problem. It's an us problem and we need to figure it out together. And so we're going to talk about this specifically from the urban perspective today, though there's definitely learnings for uh, the rural community as well. Um, and we have some great guests who are joining us to help us do that. So we have Sherelle Dorsey, founder of Black Tech Charlotte, Michael Abensauer, executive director of the Cramden Institute, Seth Urban, chief innovation officer at the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, and Veronica Creech, director of economic development at the city of Raleigh. Welcome to all of you. And Seth, we're going to get started with you. So one of the themes that we're going to discuss today is digital inclusion and building digitally, digitally equitable communities. So can you just tell us what digital inclusion means and how the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library system is working on digital inclusion? Sure, Maggie, and uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I really I let this truck pass by. Sorry, I'm sitting on my front porch. Um, I really felt like that was well said about the urban and rural. I mean, it, it is an us problem. And so I, I just want to just echo that. So thank you for that. Um, when it comes to digital inclusion, I, I like to say it's a three-legged stool, um, which is uh, you know not the best analogy, but it works for, for me. Um, it's access to the internet. It's access to devices. And it's access to the education opportunities that allow people to understand how to leverage both that device and that access. And so really at the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, we try um, to provide as much as we can in that. And I'm, I'm speaking right now in like pre-COVID world. So uh, in, in the PC world, um, in the PC world, we would offer free Wi-Fi for everybody who could come in. So we offer about five, uh, half a million unique uh, Wi-Fi sessions a fiscal year. Um, we offer access to free computers um, so that people can, can leverage that technology. Um, and we provide about um, five, almost 4,000 technology classes um, within our branches so that everybody can feel like um, they, can, they can understand this technology um, all the way from the, the most basic uh, digital inclusion, like what is a mouse, what is a keyboard, up to basic coding classes. Um, partnering with, with folks like Sherelle Dorsey to, to kind of help bring in experts uh, on higher level um, digital inclusion um, stuff. So th that, that's kind of how we um, how we operate in the normal times. Uh, we are we are working really hard to figure out, OK, how do we provide this kind of um, resources in the COVID times? So and I'm looking forward to talking about that later. Great, and we'll dive into that in, in a little bit. Um, Michael, I want to turn to you. Um, Seth mentioned how access to devices is really important, and the Cramden Institute refurbishes computers and provides digital skills and literacy classes. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your work, and then what was your response as soon as the pandemic hit? And Michael, I think you're on mute. There we go. Thanks. Uh, thanks again for inviting me over. Uh, and I am not in a COVID basement. This is just what the office looks like, uh, in case everybody's wondering. Uh, Cramden Institute's been around since 2003, and we've been working on the digital divide since then. 
Uh, and for many years, all we did was refurbish computers. So we would take in any donated computer from individuals and corporations, organizations, uh, state governments, cities, et cetera. We'd refurbish them the best we can and then put them back out in the community. And we've given out approximately 40,000 computers across the state uh, in approximately 93 of the 100 counties across the state. A few years ago, we realized, and I'm sure just like Seth and the libraries realized as well, that you can give somebody a computer, but if they don't know how to use it, it's going to be a limited use. Uh, and we started doing education. So digital literacy classes, after school programming, STEAM camps, STEAM uh, programs to really get not just kids involved, but all facets. And you touched on your presentation earlier. It, 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 it's the digital divide cuts across a wide swath, swath and you know, people forget about seniors, communities of color, low income, rural, urban. I mean, it, it doesn't really matter where you go in the state. It's an issue. So when COVID hit, you know, like everybody else, we said, well, there's a need and the need was accentuated. And the best story I have for that is on Facebook, we put a feed saying, look, usually there's a, per there's a way to get a computer from us. You have to get a teacher to nominate, et cetera. We just said, if you need a computer, just call us. You know, we understand there's a need. One and a half million public school students were about to get sent home to do remote learning literally overnight. And we knew there was a need just in the immediate area. We're based in the, in, in the triangle. Uh, off that one Facebook post, we got five to 7,000 calls over the next couple of days. And we had thought to ourselves that we don't really give that many computers in the triangle. We still give a, about a third of them, but we've been really actively trying to push computers out into the more rural parts of the state because that's where we thought the need was. Yeah. So when we got that response, we immediately said to ourselves, well, wow, we thought we'd saturated the triangle. We're not even close to it. Uh, it was more of an education and awareness issue than anything else. So every single parent that had a child in school or a couple of kids in school came to us immediately. So we cranked out as many computers as we could. I think we gave close to 1,000, 1,200 computers out. Um, and then we had a curtail operations back. So the pandemic has you know, there's a highlight there, there's a silver lining of the pandemic, it is that it has laid this the divide bare more than any other uh, emergency I could think of. Uh, and, and Seth touched on it. I mean, it really is, if you don't have this, you're just not gonna be able to survive, period. You can't do work, you can't do your kids going to go to school. Uh, it, it's a huge issue, it touches every facet. So we are struggling and trying to get as many computers out the door as we can, in a way that's stay, safe for our staff and safe for recipients. But it's becoming an enormous challenge. And that of course is the challenge right now, continuing to do your work in a safe way that's safe for everyone. And, and we'll dive into that a little bit more. Sherelle, I do wanna to turn to you though. Um, Black Tech Charlotte is Charlotte's first and only inclusive tech hub for entrepreneurs and technologists of color. So I'm wondering if you could highlight a little bit more about the work that you do and talk about how your work has shifted because of the pandemic. Absolutely. So we launched in 2016, um, primarily at the result of a number of different issues. Number one, they're not really being a meeting ground around Black technologists being highlighted in the city of Charlotte in a substantive way around this idea of talent and opportunity. We talk a lot about digital divide, but we don't necessarily take the opportunity to leverage data on who has access and who's represented um, and sort of how those individuals can start to be catalysts for ongoing support of communities that want to have access to technology training, skills, jobs, entrepreneurship, which I've built two businesses successfully from my laptop and Wi-Fi. Um, I don't want to underestimate the power that just simply having a device and a connection can provide for anyone in any sort of um, in sort of circumstance. And so, um, you know, Black Tech Charlotte typically has in-person events. And so we kind of built our, our initiative around this idea of gathering and community and training. And so I want to say January was probably our last in-person event. We had a coding and careers sort of boot camp meetup. We had about 100 plus people who had attended and we were we, we kind of take over various spaces throughout Charlotte. And we happened to be at Tabris Coworking, which had just opened up. And so we, you know, we do food, we do drinks, and, you know, we have instructors showing folks like very easy, like, you know, HTML or what have you. 
parents, you know, uh, teenagers and, you know, young adults who have just graduated high school and they're looking to perhaps start boot camps um, prior to, you know, transitioning into their kind of university environment. Um, older adults, you know, those in their 60s and 70s who for the first time wanted to learn a little bit of code. You know, we were having these sessions and these meet, these meetups together as a community and learning as a community. And so, of course, as the pandemic, as the pandemic hit and we were, you know, seeing that, okay, it's, it's not going to be safe enough for us to have in-person events. We had several planned in partnership with the Flatiron School. We immediately had to change we have to change the way in which we were delivering services and support to our community. And so, you know, not to be deterred, the reality is that we still want to be able to have these skills training and opportunities for our community. And so every Tuesday evening, we come together online and we have a, a session on coding, whether it be on Ruby on Rails, or we're talking about cybersecurity, trying to recreate that experience online has definitely proven to be a challenge, but we knew that we couldn't just kind of fade into the background, right? There still are our services and opportunities. And even as we look at the future of work and we know disproportionately black people um, and, and those from the Latinx community are going to be disproportionately disadvantaged as it relates to the future of jobs. So even with the pandemic here, um, it completely altering and accelerating the way in which we're living and working or not working the reality is like the need has always been there. These conversations have ha been had ad nauseum. I think particularly in Charlotte when, you know, Digital Charlotte sort of came into play a few years ago when I first moved to Charlotte, they were trying to address this digital divide. And I'll be, I'll be quite honest with you, Maggie, and I'm sure this might be the same for a lot of the panelists here today. It is frustrating. It's absolutely frustrating that so many of us were working on this issue and trying to forewarn our cities and our communities that those without access, the same stats are the same that they've been five or six years ago. Pandemic or not, this was always a critical issue, right? And so now we're having to scramble and support families and students who don't have access so that they can continue their education. And, and so I'm, 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 I'm quite frankly still very much frustrated with leadership in our cities and our communities that did not move to provide line item budgets to ensure our students had what they need. But more important, this is a, a wage issue because parents that have livable wages to pay rent, provide food and put food on the table and have access to transportation and who can afford Wi-Fi and, and devices, we wouldn't have to have the scrambling of finding ways to get them resources if the families had resources in the first place. So I just wanna go ahead and toss all of that onto the table because we would not be here had we had strong leadership pushing these initiatives a decade ago. Yeah, and I'm seeing nods from every panelist on here who um, seems to be in agreement with, with that frustration. I'm sure all of us can share stories of how we've been told that this isn't the issue that we should focus on. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Sherelle. We'll dive deeper into that. Um, this is a, a great moment to bring in Veronica. Veronica, you are the Economic Development Director for the City of Raleigh. So I thought maybe you could start by just talking about the the relationship between digital inclusion and economic development. I think that ties to what Sherelle is talking about as well. Maggie, thank you. And um, it's great to be here and to be with each of these panelists whom I've met in various places. So it's good to be in the same room again after being separate for quite some time. Um, working with the city of Raleigh, I was really thrilled about um, considering the city as my next career step. Um, I was in Washington, D.C., working for a national organization, Everyone On, whose sheer focus is the policy and actions needed to close the digital divide. When I learned that Raleigh was moving to or wanting to create an equitable economic development model, um, that was very interesting to me. And uh, to credit of the city's leadership, they were clear, we're really not exactly sure what that's going to look like, but we will know when we have the right leader in place to help us get there. And when we talked about digital inclusion as a part of not just economic development, but equitable economic development that um, resonated with everyone around the table. The leadership in Raleigh, I'm, I'm very excited to say, has had closing the digital divide or addressing the digital divide in the city's strategic plan. Um, we're wrapping up this um, 
succession of the strategic plan was a three-year commitment. So we had closing the digital divide as a part of the strategic plan for the last three years, as well as our leadership was taking that commitment forward and continuing to um, designate resources. If an item's in our strategic plan, then it becomes a priority of resources, staff, time, research, partnership. It gets the support that um, you know, when you have competing priorities, which we always will have competing priorities. So the digital, addressing the digital divide in Raleigh is remaining a priority in our world. Um, Verena, I'm gonna, just mm -hmm. to jump in here, could you talk a little bit about what the digital divide looks like in Raleigh? We know that in Wake County, according to the, the FCC and the American Community Survey, almost 100% of people have access to the internet, but only about 82, 83% are subscribing. So could you talk about some of that, that disparity and what the, the divide looks like? Sure. Um, so as you open with the data and you know, how that data is created and you can get behind where the numbers come from. And we all know that that is not an accurate representation of household by household. And this whole census track capture is um, beyond misleading. I have actually um, charged uh, verbally publicly that that um, is um, almost criminal. Like it's just right there. Like it's a misrepresentation of, of reality. And um, it doesn't look good for the internet service providers. It does not help leaders understand the depth of a problem. So there is, I think, a moral issue with the data itself. So um, when you go household to household, um, we know, we just recently did an, an, an assessment of city properties or city facilities, um, community centers where our young people gather, senior centers and, you know, neighborhood. We inc included Boys and Girls Club clubs to see which ones had Wi-Fi, which were available for our young people to do their homework after school or to even engage in content creation or boot camps um, over the summer. And we were surprised how many of our own facilities are not uh, Wi-Fi capable or not Wi-Fi um, connected. And so kids actually choose where they hang out over the summer uh, you know, with the resources that meet their summer needs or their after school needs. Um, we still have kids going to the hospitals and other places to pick up their spillover Wi-Fi versus being able to go to a publicly funded community center, for example. So we don't have a strong number beyond the numbers that we're talking about today, um, other than now we're in the pandemic, how many kids could not stay connected in school? And I've, I've asked the question a couple of times with Wake County and, you know, it does take time to understand the full depth and breadth of folks' resources. Um, and I've not gotten a solid number, but as it relates to economic development, if our kids today, third and fourth and fifth grade, aren't getting fully connected to the curriculum, to learning, to being fully engaged, we're going to see that um, unintended ripple effect just shortly as there are young people trying to get jobs as teenagers, as they try to access um, summer employment, um, college applications, those deficits are going to start showing up. And we're all very familiar with the school to prison pipeline and the importance of reading by third grade. I do not know if we have been socially just to our third graders this year. How many third graders did not, right, Seth? So how many third graders did not have the full connectivity they needed this year to close their reading gap, to achieve their reading scores? So we're going to see in very short terms data that we do need to get a handle on, need to understand. So I will say that our city leadership is not afraid of the data. They're not afraid of and learning what's out there. At the same time, you know, a city is a functioning partner within a county and our education system is a county system. So it's incumbent upon us to understand what the challenges are and create plans and policies to address them. And that's what we're, we're doing with the digital divide in Raleigh related to our city's leadership. We could dive more into the economic development impact as well as what we perceive is happening um, with our young people, which is that pipeline of talent. And in that regard, I would say to the opening comments around the, um, uh, the rural urban divide from folks called, you know, we want to close that as well. Um, our, yeah, our Veronica, could you say a little bit more about from Raleigh's perspective, even as you work to close the digital divide within the city, why does it matter for rural connectivity to be a major priority as well? 
So we need everyone connected. Um, the city of Raleigh in no way is saying um, as the capital city or as a large population city, we should by any means be a priority to close the digital divide. Our talent and our workforce, our educators, our community leaders, many commute in from rural communities. So we want as equally and as um, uh, equitably all communities, all students to be connected because nobody is static anymore. Like, well, before the pandemic, we were not, we're not static, we're very mobile people, we're a very mobile society. We want all the kids that come into our area and employees that come into our area and folks in Raleigh who go out into other areas to have very competitive skill sets and the tools to achieve whatever their goal is that day. If it's safety during recreation, if it's knowing which you know, community centers to go to to achieve what their goals are that day, if it's jobs, teaching, education, learning. So for me, and, and I've shared this in, in other circles, internet at home is as critical as having utilities in the home. So if you know that your neighbor's lights have been turned off, you know that family's in crisis. They're gonna lose food in the refrigerator, their kids are not gonna be able, no one's gonna be able to read, like, Nothing's that house is in crisis. A home that does not have the internet to me is equally in crisis as a home who's lost its utilities. And until our leadership and policy makers and the folks who divide the serious resources to address priority issues, internalize that, that internet in the home, not in the home, is as a crisis as not having utilities in the home, um, we have got to move to that uh, acceptance and framework to prioritize resources. Yeah, that's a really good point about utilities. And one of the major challenges for cities, I know, is public housing and ensuring that public housing has Wi-Fi in, built into the system. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of those challenges and any strategies you think about in, in order to make sure that public housing has access. Sure. So it's, it's a little confusing where public housing, so HUD funded or you know, housing and urban development funded assisted housing lives. Then there are some counties that have their own um, um, bonds, like bonds to build low income housing. And then you know, cities also uh, create funds when possible and where possible. It may be a bond, it may be an, other priorities from the general fund to support the building or provision of low income, low to mod housing. Um, when a city or a county provides funding, that is the perfect opportunity to build into a contract, a public-private partnership, to require new construction or even rehab construction to build in a Wi-Fi solution. Um, I think that um, many local governments have not been as quick on that um, leverage um, as they should have been and, and can be. Um, some folks are getting nervous about that, and there are many a private industry internet service providers who would lead local government to believe, uh, no, those are legal waters, you gotta be careful there. Um, and I think you know, people should be careful in all of our waters, but when public dollars fund private initiatives, including low to moderate income housing, uh, the funding public entity has the um, leverage to require certain community goods um, and if Wi-Fi is a utility, slam dunk. So we need, that's why we need internet and, and Wi-Fi connectivity to be moved and declared a utility once and for all. So we can have that built into public private partnership um, efforts that go to create low to moderate income housing. Um, and then in the meantime, where utility, where um, internet is not a utility right now, local governments through those public private partnerships should require the Wi-Fi solution with any of the construction. Yeah. So one more question before we move on to some of our other speakers, and I believe we have a slide for this, but Veronica, could you just walk us through some of the strategies that the city of Raleigh is um, developing to, to close the digital divide and to make Raleigh more digitally inclusive? Happy to. Um, so again, I have to point back to our leaders, you know, our mayor and our council very much believe in a strong workforce. They believe in the um, building blocks of economic mobility, um, including like high quality childcare, um, safe communities. So there are a lot of tenants that we attend to, but digital inclusion is right up there. 
um, and starting with our youth. The city invests its own general fund dollars to support a program called Digital Connectors. That's a program that engages high school students uh, that um, build that three-legged stool that Seth talked about. And when they join the program, they get a device, they um, receive digital um, literacy, as well as they meet in places that have connectivity. Um, then after the training as a digital connector, uh, those young folks then train senior citizens and some of our older uh, adults here in Raleigh in building that three-legged stool, uh, providing devices, um, the digital literacy component. Um, is the main thing and then it's up to the participant if they have connectivity in their home or not. Um, as I mentioned, closing the digital divide or addressing the digital divide in our strategic plan. Um, our strategic plan consists of six pillars um, of, of, of investment and one is economic development and innovation and within that pillar is uh, closing the digital divide. We have a cross-departmental team that um, includes folks who work in everything from easement and access of uh, the telecommunications folks, uh, economic development and housing in, in, in our housing department as well. So we look at the digital divide across our pillars to see um, how that is a driver or undermining, quite honestly, um, some of our own goals when our uh, families are not connected. We have our Smart Cities Initiative um, NOAA Auto leads that, and NOAA keeps up with national and international practices as it re relates to smart cities. Um, one of the initiatives under smart cities is how can we, as a local government, provide more Wi-Fi and more you know, hotspots and um, Wi-Fi connected zones around the city that folks in all of our parks or city-owned um, facilities or managed facilities would have connectivity, and you literally can do business and learning anywhere. Um, and then I serve on you know, Amy Huff, Huffman's team on the North Carolina Digital Equity team. Um, and that's where we, you know, with the folks around this table and from around the state, continue to make sure that we keep an eye on and activity around this body of work. So these are like five um, commitments that the city of Raleigh have invested in to make sure that we are um, not getting, putting this on the back burner, but keeping it in the forward commitment. Wonderful. Thanks, Veronica. I think we're going to move over to Seth, who I know is also on that digital, digital equity team. But I just want to note that um, George in the chat asks if anyone knows the cost to provide free Wi-Fi to the entire state. And George, I know that the North Carolina Broadband Infrastructure Office has some of those statistics. I believe it's a, an in the billions dollar amount. Um, if someone knows the answer, um, we can get to that. Um, but if not, then I will make sure that that's in our show notes moving forward. Um, Seth, I, I do want to move to you and, and move over to, to what's happening in Charlotte. So, you know, we talked about how Charlotte um, Mecklenburg libraries are really at the, the forefront of supporting digital inclusion in the city. And I wonder what it's been like to be closed during this time and how you've still been able to address digital inclusion and, and where you haven't been able to. Yeah, I, and I just want to say, like, nothing gets me fired up in this conversation. So I appreciate everything you said, Sherelle. I am I am right there with you. Like I I have I it's it's an interesting dynamic because I feel like we are talking about our government institutions shifting from proactivity around this from reactivity. And we are just it's it's a human psychological thing too. Like like so I just I, I 100% agree we've got to shift Wait, Seth, I want to dig into that for a moment. What do you mean by proactivity versus reactivity? Could you unpack that a little bit? Yeah, I, I guess what I'm saying is that digital inclusion could have been solved a decade ago if we had the will to do it. We, we didn't, or we don't. And now we are in this crisis where everyone is reacting. And there's good things that come from a crisis. And I'm going to be the first to say that because we can at least now leverage the reaction. Like we can leverage the reaction to point people to a new way. Um, so I'm going to come back to your question, Maggie. So yeah. apologies. Um, we were able as an institution, as a library, to transition a lot of what we typically do on a day-to-day -day basis to the digital, to our digital platform. We were able to set up a digital reference desk to answer questions via chat. We were able to roll out digital programming to Facebook, to 
through our website, via Zoom, all these things. We were able to, to kind of do a lot of stuff in a very quick time, thanks to our talented staff and our other leaders in the organization, but we could not provide. There's no way for us to provide access. There's no way for us to provide a way for people to even have access to this stuff. Um, so COVID just like highlights like, you know, that, and there's so many, the, the, the trend and, and the argument is, well, that's why there's public libraries. If people can't afford access, that's why that there's public libraries. The problem is that's not good enough in 2020. Like, I'm glad it's here, but I'm going to be honest with everybody on the panel. The public library can only do so much. Um, and this is systemic. And it is tied to morality and justice. And I, I want to echo that clearly. Um, the public library will always try to do the best that it can under the scope and in, and in its, uh, in its um, it, it will do as best it can given its funding, given its leadership, given its limits. But there are major limits on what we can do. And so COVID's really highlighted that we, have, we do not have um, a way to provide access outside of our traditional brick and mortar offerings. So the things that we did do, the things that we tried to do is I, I you know, I called our, our partners at Mecklenburg County and said, I want our Wi-Fi on 24 seven so that people can at least go into our parking lot and hopefully can get some access. It's not a perfect solution. Um, we also called uh, Time Warner Cable and some of the other um, ISPs, I'm sorry, Spectrum, Comcast, whatever, whatever name it's going under now and said, open up your public Wi-Fi's, open them up because people are going to be, they're, they're not going to have another um, access point. Um, we're also working with Mecklenburg County to outfit our courier vans um, with a mobile solution so that we can be more flexible because I feel like um, I, I'm trying to move our institution into um, proactivity as much as we can. And so I feel like we're probably going to have to undergo another closure of the library. And so how do I provide access in, in this, this go round? Um, I can move my, my, mo my, uh, my courier vans with, with the internet around the different communities who may need it. So we're trying to shift uh, to that proactivity piece and we're trying to really hammer the drum that this is important. Um, it's, it's just so, if we're not gonna try to fix this now, then when are we? That's the question I would ask everybody on the panel, everybody listening, when's a better time? There isn't a better time. Yeah, thanks for that, Seth. And I appreciate you saying that libraries can't do this alone and libraries so often have been doing this alone, both in urban and rural spaces. Um, though Charlotte does have an alliance that is working on digital inclusion. And I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Charlotte Digital Inclusion Alliance and who's a part of it and, and what are you guys trying to do? Sure, the Charlotte Digital Inclusion Alliance is, um, is an alliance of institutions, um, government entities like the city and the county, um, universities um, like CPCC, UNCC, Queens University. Um, and we work hard to ensure that we are following best practices in terms of digital inclusion efforts, that we're not duplicating efforts, that we're sharing resources, um, and that we're working together. And I think um, what's been really interesting is that, you know, during this time, I've been really encouraged by this group. And, I, and I'll mention that I, I'm, I'm the convener of this group right now. I'll roll off eventually, but uh, right now I'm convening this group and we're coming together um, in a new way, and we're trying to tap into some of these CARES resources that are coming up, coming online. So, um, so we're we're trying to look at systemic solutions to this problem as best we can. Um, yeah, and and who is a part of this group? So, who are you engaging with? Sure, we, I work with Digital Charlotte, as Sherelle mentioned them. Digital Charlotte, um, the, the three universities I mentioned, E2D, which is also a refurbisher partner. Um, much like Cramden that Michael represents, um, CMS um, and the city and the county, um, different representatives. And, and the goal is just to, to really try to think broader than our own institution narrow focus. Um, it's hard work because a lot of times that we like to live in our silos of what we do in terms of digital inclusion. 
but it's really meaningful when, when you're able to see um, the partners come together to, to find a solution. Um, and I think uh, this, this moment in time has really showcased the, the validity of this work um, in such a, such a meaningful way. Yeah, it really has, to your point of finding something positive coming out of the pandemic. Um, highlighting this has certainly been, while tragic, also hopefully it'll get the attention of people that it that need the attention. Um, I, you know, you heard Cheryl's frustration with having talked about this and the major digital divide in Charlotte. And so I'm wondering, Seth, if you could tell us a little bit about um, what does the digital divide in Charlotte look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, absolutely. Well, it, it, it follows a, you know, it follows an unsurprising pattern, unfortunately. Um, you know, in 2015, I think the Chetty study said that Charlotte and the economic mobility, a kid was born in poverty, they're probably going to stay in poverty. And we, could, we can look at the census tracts and see the pattern of where that is happening um, in an economic mobility piece. Uh, you, you layer on digital inclusion and digital adoption, it follows the same pattern. So um, it's, it's uh, the crescent and the wedge, which, which in, in Charlotte speak, um, describes the, un the disconnected communities and the connected communities. And oftentimes it's divided up um, via race and socioeconomic uh, um, uh, class. Um, and so what does it look like? Uh, well, I'll, I'll kind of jump in, Maggie, and, and say that the library, along with uh, some partners in the CDIA, have gone in to go for an IMLS CARES grant to kind of try to, uh, try to um, work towards a systemic solution in one small community. Um, so we identified a one census tract in the West Boulevard corridor, which is a part of the Crescent. Um, in that West Boulevard corridor, 30% um, of that one census tract has adopted broadband. That means 70% in this one census tract does not have broadband. That doesn't touch whether they have a computer at home. It doesn't touch whether um, they have access to it. And so to, to kind of boil it back down to a personal level, when the schools closed, I had a computer for my kid. My kid was able to get on and continue their education, albeit it probably wasn't the best ever because it was me doing the homeschooling. Um, but what is, a, what is a person doing in that census tract? So that's, that's one census tract in this crescent that has um, different economic realities that lag so much more than the, than the city as a whole data-wise. Um, someone said uh, the, the data issue is a moral issue. It's very much a moral issue. It's probably a lot worse in reality than what the data is showing me. Um, so our goal in my mind is to answer a question, how can the library provide access to, to the community when we're closed? That's really the, the heart of the grant ask. And uh, I can talk about that now, Maggie, if you want me to, or I, I can hang back. So, yeah, but, I think I think we're going to move on um, to Sherelle, to a different part of yeah. Charlotte, but um, we'll get back to you. There's just so much to get into here. I wish we had another hour. Um, but Sherelle, I, I want to come to you now and dive into something that you mentioned earlier, um, which is that the, the people that you're working with at Black Tech Charlotte, you see them as catalysts for the community. Could you talk a little bit more about what you mean by that? Yeah, I think that we don't have enough narrative or study on what black and brown innovation look like in this country, um, particularly within our cities and our states. And I think because we do not have an accurate, we talked, we, there was some mention about data. And the reality is like, if we are not actively collecting on like who is represented from an innovation standpoint, who the, the black tech high growth founders and, um, and workers are, we will not have an understanding of who's getting resources to continue that work. And so with Black Tech Charlotte, within a four year period, we were able to cultivate a list of over 2000 plus Black technologists and founders. And that's a very different kinds of conversation about what those particular needs are. These are individuals who are hiring and if they had the right resources 
they could also they could, they could grow that exponentially instead of maybe one or two employees or three to five contractors they could be creating jobs but the reality is because of systemic challenges because of the lack of funding and investment and because of the lack of visibility and understanding who they are and what they're actually building we don't get to see that kind of job growth happen so when we talk about systemic challenges, we have to really look holistically at, again, of, of the narrative of, of, again, like where investment happens and where it does not. Unfortunately, the tie between the digital divide and investment in, in zip codes and communities that are traditionally underserved is directly tied to the individuals who have also been able to be maybe first generation escape from poverty, graduated from college, has master's degree, about 75% of our Black Tech Charlotte members have master's degrees in fields like engineering, sciences, and maths. But you don't hear that narrative within local media, right? It's kind of always this kind of doom and gloom. But these individuals, when we surveyed them last year, are 100% dedicated and committed to helping to teach STEM skills and training skills. These are individuals who know what it's like to live in environments where they had no resources. And so for them, their propensity towards investing in community is, is very great. They're very concerned about what the next generation of kids um, has access to, especially black and brown kids. And I say this is directly tied, I think, to, to what Veronica was saying about a bit earlier in terms of what's going to happen to that generation of kids who do have this educational slip and don't necessarily have the resources to make that transition to a career or, or the education necessary to get into high paid jobs. What happens is we're perpetually perpetuating this cycle of poverty. And so I think, again, you know, we have to go back and assess the totality of what the digital divide looks like, because even for people with access, if there is no level of visibility and autonomy and support in terms of allowing individuals from the communities that we say we're supporting to be leaders in those communities and have the resources necessary to deploy opportunity, where again, we're, 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 still, we're still placating a generation, a community against this pervasive challenge of mobility. And so, you know, we know that the future of jobs is going to be in certain fields. And we have grossly underprepared our communities to do that. That's the same for Charlotte. That's the same for the, the Triangle. That's the same for most cities, particularly urban dense cities in America. And so I think that, I think that we have to kind of almost like start from, start from the top again. <laughs> what are those root challenges and causes and sort of how do we bring in enough voices? And I'm not even saying us and these kind of like folks who have the great words and the jargon in the background and we know all of the challenges, but if you talk to maybe that grandmother, you know, who is, and, and I'm literally talking about a grandmother who I, I, I had an opportunity to meet at an event who was raising her two grandchildren and trying to get them into the mayor's employment summer program within tech spaces so they could have a paid opportunity for the summer. Like those are the individuals that I want to hear from because they're usually the, the, the catalyst in their communities. Again, and, and as well as the, the black techies who are finding it frustrating to work and live in cities that do not recognize who they are, yeah. that grossly un, un, do not recognize who they are. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, and I do just want to dig into um, the work that you're doing right now, the partnership with the Flatiron School, how you are um, preparing students and adults who um, have to be online right now and how you're helping them reskill. So could you talk a little bit about that partnership? Absolutely. So yeah, so Flatiron School, we actually developed a partnership with in September. The headquarters is out of New York City. They've had campuses all across the country and then moved to this digital model where people could be self-paced in fields like cybersecurity, software engineering, um, UX, UI design, um, and various other skills as well, data science as well, which of course is, is very large and kind of one of the driving industries in Charlotte in particular. And so what we realized um, you know, at Black Tech Charlotte was a lot of folks were reaching out to us about training opportunities, but they were also managing families and full-time jobs. And so it didn't make most sense for them to take off from those, those jobs to, you know, of course, you know, 
hold off on income for six to eight months in order to take this program. And so the online opportunity and why it felt like a really good match was the opportunity to learn and to grow, but at the same time, like not have to completely stop everything that you're doing because that's just not feasible for everyone to stop and go back to school. I had the privilege of being able to stop and go back to grad school but that's not the same for everyone else. And so the flexibility of education options does provide people an opportunity to say, okay, hey, listen, I, I wanna learn these skills to either get into tech or maybe I wanna learn these skills to up-level my job because I know that my skills are becoming obsolete. And so I need to ensure that I have a long-term survival within my, my, um, my employment. And what's really interesting about Flatiron is they have um, these self-paced programs there's still some community centric models around in terms of being connected to people locally in your community. Prior, of course, to the pandemic, you could go and work out of a WeWork and have study groups or what have you, um, but also be connected not just to the skills platform, but also to some of the career services that, that they provide and helping you to get matched to, um, to top employers. And what's interesting, I think about that now is they have like these large companies that are typically based out of Silicon Valley that are still looking for talent now in these spaces Places that aren't the New Yorks or the Seattles or or the Silicon Valleys, but um, are for all over. They're just looking for talent, and so there's kind of a, this network that people have access to that's beyond just learning the skills. Um, so they really do actively attempt to to connect you. Um, and then just secondarily to Maggie, um, and you and I have talked about this just um, very briefly, but there are some training camps um, like Intech Girls Camp, which was actually started by. Kalia Broswell, and I wanted to take the time to just mention that she's a North Carolina State University graduate, um, Apple engineer, and came back to Charlotte a few years ago to continue to expand her, um, her training camp for young girls in tech. She's run middle school camps and high school camps connecting young ladies to women in tech leadership. And so when I look at that opportunity around uh, students and parents who are able to connect their children to these skills and, and some of them who have grad who have grown up and graduated actually have gotten um, scholarships at NC State. You're really talking about someone who has this, had, had this brilliant idea and the technical know-how to create opportunities for over 1700 girls and like this summer she has two camps that she's running virtually that's been opened up obviously now because it's not very location centric but like this is the kind of entrepreneur and, and thought leader and, you know, again, black techie from North Carolina that like we have to continue to supporting because the work is so is so incredible and it leads these young these young folks who are from all kinds of backgrounds into new opportunity in the, in the, the jobs that are coming. Yep, that's a really great point. And that actually moves us to, to Michael. I want to get to you before we have to, to wrap up. Um, you know, you mentioned at the beginning that, that Crandon is really trying to support a lot of the people that Sherelle was talking about, um, but English language learners, we know seniors are often forgotten about. Only 67% of seniors nationally subscribe to the internet. So could you talk a little bit more about how Crandon is supporting those groups? Sure. Uh, it's yeah, like I mentioned earlier, you know, for four or five, six years ago is when we determined that there was a great need for digital literacy skills and not just giving somebody a box and saying, have fun with that, right? So we started coming up with all these different programs and the programs constantly are evolving, right? We're trying them in classes and we're trying to see what works best. We're surveying our participants before we start the class to see what skills they actually have. Then we're surveying them at the end of the class to see what skills they've wanted or gained or have now that they can use. And then we try a third survey, which is six, three, six, three or six months down the line to see what are they actually using their computers for. Uh, and we've been offering, you know, free digital literacy classes for years now. We don't really advertise them. It, it's open to anybody in the community who wants to come. And we've never marketed it. It's just word of mouth. And we do them at Cramden. We do them in public housing or across the triangle. We do it with partner organizations. And slowly but surely, we've gotten a lot of people out there. And, and the care and the stick, and I'm sure Seth and everybody on, on the panel has seen this, we do digital literacy classes. Then at the end of four classes, they get a free computer. So there's always kind of a carrot incentive to finish the classes and get the skills. And we've discovered time after time that the folks who are coming to our classes, if there's an overwhelming demographic, it is black females, 55 plus head of household continuously. And it's 
at first it was a little surprising. We thought we'd get a blend and a variety of, of folks, but that was where the need was. Uh, we also started getting more need from senior communities. And you know, we've had to tailor how we teach our classes because how you teach seniors is completely different from how you teach kids who are coming in who tear apart a computer and learn how it works. You know, completely different uh, mindset and instructional method and pedagogy. But we're you know, slowly going through this. And we do an average, you know, somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 people a year go through these classes. The problem now with COVID is that this is not something we can bring online, right? If we're talking about basic digital literacy classes, we're talking about literally, how do you press a button to start the computer? How do you right click? How do you left click? Those are not the type of classes that you can do online. We're talking basic, basic digital literacy classes. And those are ones that we find that people really want. Uh, and, you know, we're trying to also evolve new programs so that once you've gone through the basic literacy, if you want to learn more, you can step up and then even go from there. But the classes we're talking about and the population we're working with are looking for very basic needs. And we're trying to provide those basic needs, a device and training on how to use it. Uh, and unfortunately, we just can't do that in person right now. And we can't, as much as I want to, have a class of 20 or so seniors on a Zoom call it's almost self-defeating to do that because you have to be there in person. You have to have an instructor, you have to have a TA, you have to have folks hands-on and everybody learns at a different pace. And that's how classes work, right? The best classes. So we've tried to respond to the communities. You know, we do obviously uh, 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 Spanish speaking classes. Uh, we do class for seniors. We do class after school programs that kind of uh, touch on what Cheryl talked about is trying to really focus on communities that have not had computer science classes in their schools. Because talking about inequality, not every school can afford to have computer electives or coding electives. That's, 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 that's something that you see in affluent communities that you don't see in a lot of other communities. So we try to step in and say, look, if your school doesn't offer these classes, bring them to us. We have programs that can do that and activate in them an interest in STEM an interest, a uh, lifelong interest, hopefully in a career field like this. Uh, so that's something we've been trying to do uh, for a long time. You know, we, all I keep telling everybody is right now we've hit a pause, but we'll start back up and the need is going to be probably double what it is right now. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. And I'm so sorry, we do need to end the conversation here. I do appreciate all of our, our panelists here today, our guests. This was um, a, a really nuanced, interesting conversation. And so I appreciate you all of the all the work that you're doing in your communities and for North Carolina. Um, I do want to just take a quick moment to highlight a digital inclusion program that IEI has just launched in partnership with the Broadband Infrastructure Office. And it's called Band and and our goal is to equip counties to meet needs and build more digitally equitable communities. Our ultimate vision is to make North Carolina the first state in the nation where every county has a digital inclusion plan in place. Um, so there are a couple grant cycles coming up. This summer we're providing $5,000 rapid response community innovation grants for digital inclusion projects. Um, this fall will run a technical assistance program to help counties build digital inclusion plans and that's in partnership with the broadband infrastructure office and then in spring 2021 we will have um, implementation funding uh, more $5,000 grants to help implement those digital inclusion plans um, there is more on our website if you're interested in applying um, and that should be included in the chat um, and we are looking forward to you all joining us next week um, for our next installment of First in Future Jumpstarting K-12 Learning. We'll look at what North Carolina school systems are doing during this still uncertain summer planning period to prepare learning plans for the upcoming school year. Leslie Boney will be back as host next week. If you have an idea for our show, let us know or let me know your thoughts. Our show today is sponsored by Tony Brown in honor of Dean Jeff Braden. First in Future is produced by Greg, Greg Hedgepeth and James Herrick. Kirsten Chains gets the word out and keeps our chat going. Renee Potts does our slides. Simone Coleman does our research. We really value having you here with us each week. If you like today's show, the recording and slides will be posted on our website, emergingissues.org by noon tomorrow. I'm Maggie Woods. Thanks for listening and participating. Stay safe and see you in the future. <laughs>